what's left is uh the West Bank, which is this right here. This is the West Bank and Gaza. Gaza's this little strip of land. So back in 1947, they used to all live together. You know what I mean? Um, this was uh, right after World War II. So we, uh, well, the British helped settle, um, help colonize, help settle uh, the, the, you know, the Jews that were prosecuted in World War II uh, in Palestine. But throughout time, as you can see right here, 1947, the partition plan was this. They were going to divide it up. Right, they're gonna say this is for Jews, this is for Palestinians, blah blah blah. You guys can live here, have equal land. Solve the problem. No, this two state solution bullshit, one state solution bullshit. They need a democracy with everyone allowed, all religions, all ethnicities. Because it seems like at this point, Israel just wants to be a fucking ethno state, a fucking Jewish ethno state. And I even read articles that they they, they want to fucking get rid of like uh. Uh, Ethiopian. They're trying to get rid of fucking Ethiopian uh, Jewish people uh, by basically giving them, like, prescribing them uh, birth control and then the, the women not knowing it, I guess, and they take it. It's really fucked up. But read this shit right here. Look. Netanyahu. Money to Hamas. Part of strategy to keep Palestinians divided. So basically, what, the, what, what Netanyahu and the, and the far-right fascist fucking government wanted to do is... Fund Hamas through Qatar. They sent money to Hamas. And they knew Hamas was a terrorist group. And they knew Hamas was going to use the money in a bad way. And Hamas did. So they, they send money to Hamas. Hamas grows, gets stronger, better, more guns, more control. And they want that to happen because then they can divide the Palestinian people. Before the Palestinian people were ruled under uh, a democratic system uh run by Fatah, right? That's a government Palestinian author authority or whatever the hell. I don't know what it's called. But then Hamas took over because in Gaza Fatah couldn't hold couldn't um basically give people health care. It couldn't it couldn't uh draw people's minds over to to them. It couldn't grab people's attention. It couldn't help people enough. And so Hamas won. And they did a coup d'etat basically and there's been no voting since but this has been the plan of the far right israeli government so they know about hamas and all that they know where they were where, where to find hamas and all the tunnels and all but they don't they don't give a fuck they're just trying to literally genocide the palestinians it's so fucking like disheartening and sad look at this uh times of israel and there's several other uh news papers and shit news uh journalists that cover this Dozens of ex-security chiefs, Netanyahu directly responsible for harm to security. So basically, uh, a bunch of ex, uh, you know, security chiefs and people that worked with Netanyahu are saying like the far right government in Israel is literally making everything worse. They're not helping. They're not helping the situation. They're 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 angering the people of palestine and west bank they're making them more agitated or they're, they're probably helping hamas again uh here's the map so here's that map i showed you guys originally so this was palestine you see you, you see how they're just literally stealing like the land like this was fine they're sharing it they're all equal but then, like, at some point, it started straying away from that. And it took over this whole chunk, this whole chunk. They just sort of sanctioned off these people into a fucking prison. This is called the largest open-air prison in, like, you know, in, in the world. It's fucking crazy. And you can see right here how there's little sections that are whited out. Because these are settlements by Israel. Israel's literally just taking, taking fucking, you know, taking houses, taking people's property they'll just take your house and your settlement and and make a little israeli settlement and so soon that's going to be gone all of this right here and it's just going to be fucking all israel and that's what they want and this also ties into the weird um religious people like some people want that to happen because then uh the end of the world prophecy begins and people and and god comes down and and the rapture happens and and 
every Christian. It's just really, it's like a lot of dumb shit. It's religious. There's military strategic reasons why we were helping them. And then there's just like presidential voting reasons. Like Biden doesn't want to lose and lose all the support of, of the Zionists or whatever. It's fucking crazy and it's really depressing. But let's keep going. I gotta go to the bathroom real quick. Let's continue with the terrible news. There's no way out. Uh, if if there's no water, there is no uh, way. Remember, guys, they're trapped in Gaza. There's no way out. Israel controls the way out, and they're not letting them out. Um, they give certain people work permits, but that's like eighteen thousand. It's like nothing, nothing. And so yeah, they're trapped. No water, no food, uh, no no goods, no no. You're fucked. You're just literally just you're in a literal prison, open air prison. Way out of Gaza. What should we do? Like, drown? Like, commit mass suicide? Is this what Israel wants? And we're not going to do that. And I was telling some somebody, some friend the other day that I am an academic. I probably the toughest thing I have at, at home is an expo marker. But if the Israelis invade, if they charge at us, charge at us, open door to door to massacre us. I'm going to use that marker, throw it at the Israeli soldiers, even if that is the last thing that I would be able to do. And this is the feeling of everybody. We are helpless. We have nothing to lose. You just heard from an academic living in Gaza who explained just how bleak the situation is. And towards the end of the clip there, that loud boom that you heard was actually a missile going off near his home. Now, that man is not a Hamas militant, but many people right now are conflating Hamas with all Palestinians in order to justify the atrocities that are being committed in Gaza right now by this man's government. But as Western governments greenlight an ethnic cleansing and war crimes... Everyone just seems to be okay with it. Everybody seems to be turning a blind eye. Media is only showing you one side. They're only showing you the suffering of Israelis, but not Palestinians. And if you're stunned by the brutality of Hamas's attack on innocent Israeli civilians, that is a very normal and human response. It is barbaric and shocking. But anger over that is now being used to justify unfathomable brutality against more innocent civilians who did nothing wrong. Brutality against people in Gaza who had nothing to do with that attack that we saw on Saturday. So I want to show you the side of this story that you're not seeing from media or hearing from politicians, and I want people to understand that fear and anger and ignorance is leading them, it's leading all of us as a society to accept atrocities on a massive, massive scale. For example, a member of Netanyahu's Likud party in the Knesset is calling for a Jericho missile to be used in Gaza, which is a nuclear weapon. Now, this comes after Israel's defense minister, Yov Gallin, called Palestinians animals and announced that food, water, and electricity will be cut off, which, by the way, is a war crime. But as a result, the Al Mezen Center reports that the Gaza Energy Authority announced that it has run out of fuel, which means that by the time you see this video, Gaza's sole power plant will no longer be in service, meaning that the population is officially in the dark, and that includes hospitals. They will no longer have the power to treat wounded civilians. And this news comes after Defense Minister Gallant announced that the Israeli military intends to commit more war crimes, as the Times of Israel reports, saying, quote, I have released all the restraints. We have regained control of the area and we are moving to a full offense. With Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying he has no intention of negotiating, a comment that received absolutely no pushback by President Biden, by the way. And this comes as the Israeli military spokesperson admits that the goal of their bombing campaign in Gaza is damage not accuracy, meaning that they're going to kill a lot of innocent civilians. And on top of that, there are reports that Israel is using white phosphorus bombs in the western port of Gaza, which is illegal under the 1980 Geneva Convention since they inflict suffocation and burning on people. Now, showing you a lot of this is against YouTube's terms of use, so I'm restricted in what I can show you. But I do think it's important to understand that the human suffering taking place right now in Gaza is incalculable. It's so utterly shocking that it caused this ambulance driver in Gaza to have a mental breakdown as he witnessed the carnage. 
بدنا نشيل اذا في شهيد كمان نجيبه ولا He is witnessing men, women, and children die before his very eyes. Our minds can barely comprehend that level of pain and suffering. And so when some of us see it, we just shut down, as he did, which is totally understandable. I don't know how I would react if I saw that much suffering. Now, let me remind you, all of this is taking place in what is effectively the world's largest open-air prison. Gaza is one of the most densely populated areas in the entire world, with 2.3 million people packed into 141 square miles, and about half of them are children under the age of 18. There's nowhere for them to go, nowhere to hide. Every single person is feeling the pain of this siege. Now, as evidence of Israeli war crimes continues to rack up, you'd think that there'd be international condemnation or even calls for restraint. And that would indeed be the case if we lived in a sane world. But we don't live in a sane world. And Western leaders aren't just turning a blind eye to Israel's war crimes. They are greenlighting it. Here's what labor leader Keir Starmer said in response to the collective punishment of Gazans. I'm very clear. Israel must have that, does have that right to defend herself, um, and Hamas bears responsibility. A siege is appropriate? Cutting off power? Cutting off water? Well, I think that Israel does have that right. It is an ongoing situation. You don't need to cut their water um, or food Obviously, off. You're just, uh, you're everything should be done within international the law, you but think I don't is want to food, step you away idiots? from you think Hamas the sort of have core water? principles that you're, you're Israel has a right to defend herself and Hamas bears responsibility for these terrorist acts. And I would call on all responsible states, particularly mm. Middle East this is the same um, shit responsible states, to call this out for what it is um, and Cuba, to stand with the world in condemning, trade, utterly anything, condemning these actions by Hamas. The international needed. community is condemning the actions taken and by Hamas, but as you saw, he Cuba, can't condemn like the war crimes. You know I mean? In like, fact, he here. said very this clearly that Israel shit. has the right to do war crimes, even though he contradicted himself and said that they should follow international law. A siege is a violation of international law, You're killing people. but Innocent he can't people. condemn it. Now, Biden's administration is no different. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken initially tweeted out support for a ceasefire, then deleted that tweet once he got backlash. Now, Biden himself hasn't condemned Israeli war crimes, and he simply called for a proportionate response while vocalizing unequivocal support for Israel. But that's not to say that Biden doesn't care at all about the suffering of innocent Gazans, because he was merciful enough to at least allow them to be ethnically cleansed in lieu of them dying. For example, TikTok influencer Henry Sisson tweets, Amazing. President Biden is working on a plan with other countries that would allow civilians to safely leave Gaza and cross the border into Egypt. This is great news. President Biden is making sure that innocent people don't die due to the actions of Hamas. So basically, President Biden is letting them leave Gaza so that Israel can take it over. Oh, oh that's so awesome. Beautiful. That's leadership. Yeah. Now, as Michael Wave correctly ethnic points out, this is ethnic cleansing. There is no ability for Palestinians who leave to return. This isn't a good compromise. This is a population transfer. Yeah. Has everyone lost their minds? And I had the same thought when I read that. Now, Sama Sabawi explains how her grandmother responded to the news, saying, I told my family in Gaza to get out when I heard reports the U.S. is coordinating a plan to offer safe passage for civilians out of Gaza into Egypt. My auntie said, do you guarantee we would be allowed to return? I couldn't. I know ethnic cleansing when I see it. She refused to leave. Death or eternal refugeehood. What would you choose? And therein lies the problem. Rather than using his influence to coordinate a call for an immediate ceasefire by the entire international community, the Biden administration is essentially giving Israel carte blanche to level Gaza. And I need you to understand the United States government has a lot of power and say here. So every single day that the bombing goes on, it is a choice. We give Israel like eight fucking billion dollars. Let me look it up real quick. Let me look it up. It's like, how much money do we give Israel every year? Bro, 14 fucking billion dollars. Are you fucking serious? 14 billion dollars and they can't fucking kill Hamas? 
You, Fourteen billion dollars and they can't destroy a little terrorist group? Are you fucking serious? Fourteen billion dollars and they gotta bombard every fucking building, building in Gaza and flatten Gaza to the ground, make it a parking lot. Wow, wow, what a what a brave, strong military. Ooh, ooh, very powerful. It's really it's a policy choice made by the Biden administration. Blood is also on his hands. Now Biden is not an exception to the rule. He is the rule because like his predecessors and virtually all Western governments, excluding Ireland, well, they don't view Palestinians as human beings. They don't view them as people. Their suffering is never taken into account. Israel always has the right to defend itself, but Palestinians do not, right? Israel needs immediate aid, but Palestinians do not. Israel needs an iron dome, but Palestinians do not. And understand that Criticizing the actions of the Israeli government is not tantamount to criticizing Israeli citizens or the Jewish people. This is a government that is doing things, and what this government does is not representative of the people that they represent. I think that's really important to say. Now, the Biden administration, in choosing to do nothing, is effectively aiding and abetting a fascist prime minister who is hell-bent on genocide. And demonization and dehumanization of the Palestinian people has been the go-to method of the Likud party and Benjamin Netanyahu. And unfortunately, that strategy has been working. He even went so far as to ahistorically claim that Hitler didn't want to exterminate the Jews because the Muslim Grand Mufti of Jerusalem did. Yeah, he he did convinced that. Hitler to do that. Because remember, Muslims are always the bad guys and he will go to any length to make them look bad, including even defending Hitler and also Hamas, but don't take my word for it. Here's what he said about Hamas. Quote, anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support bolstering Hamas and transferring money to Hamas, he told a meeting of his Likud party's Knesset members in March of 2019. This is part of our strategy, to isolate the Palestinians in Gaza from the Palestinians in the West Bank. So this is who Western liberal leaders are agreeing with. A far-right fascist whose goal is to wipe Palestinians off the face of the earth. He's not interested in negotiations or a two-state solution. He is interested in power and domination. And ironically, his rhetoric sounds eerily similar to the far right in the United States. For example, let's hear what Lindsey Graham had to say about Palestine and in particular Gaza. We're in a religious yeah. war here. I am with Israel. Do whatever the hell you have to do to defend yourself. Level the place. It's that simple. Level the place. Wipe 2.3 million people off the map just like that. No problem. Doesn't concern me at all. Just get rid of them. These people are monsters. Now, even though what he's saying there is obviously grotesque and he's saying the quiet part loud, that sentiment right there is effectively the policy that liberals like Joe Biden and Keir Starmer are adopting. The question is, why? Why do liberal leaders suddenly sound like fascists in the United States when it comes to this issue? And the answer is simple. Follow the money. Organizations like IPAC and Democratic Majority for Israel spend millions and millions of dollars lobbying politicians every single year at the behest of Israel. In fact, groups like DMFI specifically spend to defeat progressive politicians that advocate for Palestinian human rights. For example, Nina Turner had a 35 point lead over her opponent Chantel Brown, and it looked like victory was inevitable, only to later lose once Israeli interest groups began to spend big to defeat her. Now, to be crystal clear, the Israeli lobby is not lobbying on behalf of the Jewish people or even Israeli citizens. They are lobbying in the interest of the Israeli state, the Israeli government, right? And I think that that distinction is really important to make given the prevalence of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that propagate harmful lies about Jewish people using money to control the media and other institutions. That's wrong and that lie must be defeated. But what we're talking about here is a government and not people. That distinction matters. And while the Israel lobby is large, it's not even the largest foreign spender in U.S. elections, right? When it comes to foreign lobbying, other countries like China, Qatar, Russia, and Saudi Arabia actually spend more than Israel. So this isn't an Israel problem. This is a money and politics problem in the United States. But if you ever wonder why our lawmakers make puzzling decisions like they support weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, even if they know that those weapons are going to be used on innocent civilians in Yemen, well, you can thank lobbying for that. Yemen doesn't have a lobby, which is why 
our politicians are more likely to do what Saudi Arabia wants, right? Yemen can't counter the lobbying that Saudi Arabia does. And the same is true in this instance. Palestinians don't have a lobby that can counter the lobbying that's being done at the behest of Israel. They don't have comparable lobbying power, which is why almost all politicians unequivocally side with Israel, no matter what they're doing. It's why we see liberal politicians like Joe Biden and Obama side with the far right government of Israel when that seems ridiculous. It's why Democrats like Richie Torres attack his own colleagues for condemning Israeli war crimes. I mean, look at his top campaign contributor. It's AIPAC. Always follow the money. But I mean, even if you refuse that money and lobbying, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be indirectly affected by the lobbying of these foreign governments because even if you don't take their money well if you speak out against them they can bankroll your opponent and your career like that ask nina turner how that turns out which is why it's so rare to see politicians like rashida talib and Cory Bush, who speak out with clarity on this issue it's why we hear so much thirst for blood it's because these politicians are corrupt now on the subject of Rashida Tlaib, a Palestinian American, just look at the way that politicians talk about her for simply saying that Palestinians deserve human rights. Now she put up a flag in support of Palestine because she is a Palestinian. That's not going to change regardless of the circumstances, but pay close attention to what one of her colleagues said about Gaza as he's condemning Tlaib. Rashida Tlaib has the, I don't even want to call it the Palestinian flag because they're not a state, they're a territory that's about to probably get eviscerated and go away here shortly as we're going to turn that into a parking lot. We're going to turn Palestine into a parking lot. He just said that on national television. All this because his Palestinian colleague displayed a Palestinian flag. Now, on top of that, he also introduced legislation to ban her flag, by the way. But just for fun, let's take a look at who his top contributors are. Oh, look, it's the same organization that donates to Democrats, oh, man, APAC. So Therein lies the problem. This is why every politician, regardless of party, sounds the same. They're all taking money from the same interest groups, right? Now, you often hear about college students and journalists being blacklisted because they participate in a peaceful movement against Israeli apartheid, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. But do you think there's going to be any consequences for a sitting congressperson saying that we should turn Gaza into a parking lot? Of course not, because that type of dehumanizing rhetoric is normalized in the United States and, to be fair, in Europe as well, especially in the UK. So this is why we never hear about Palestinian suffering, because American politicians in both parties are paid to be complicit in their suffering and subjugation. And in theory, media could hold them accountable. That's what they're supposed to do. They are supposed to explain this conflict of interest that politicians have and call them out for it. But the problem is they're not doing that because they're complicit and also ignorant to an extent. Take CNN's Wolf Blitzer, for example, who spoke to an American doctor trapped in Gaza currently as they're being bombed. And he seemingly learned for the first time in real time that there's nowhere for citizens to escape when they're being bombed. You were there on a routine mission, a very important mission to, to, to take care of children. Were you prepared at all for this? Well, uh, whenever you go to Gaza, you always know that there's there's danger of some violence while you're there. But no, I wasn't well, sorry. Um, prepared for this. Let us know if you need Start. to go into some sort of a bomb shelter or whatever, because I can hear those explosions going off right near you. There are no bomb shelters here. Is there any safe area that you can go to? Yeah, um, actually, I have a sister-in-law who's Palestinian. She tells me to stay away from the windows, so I'm away from the window. Stay by corners of walls that are more fortified, and um, open your mouth so your your, um, your eardrums don't break if there's a lot of pressure. So I'm following her advice, and I'm in a safe part of the room. These are the people reporting on this subject, the people supposedly educating us about this conflict. Completely ignorant of the details. And that ignorance 
is then exploited by Israel in order to cultivate a very narrow view of the entire situation. As Mondo Weiss News Director Yumna explains, the Israeli military is taking foreign press on tours of sites where Israelis were killed. Israeli media reported that only international outlets have been allowed on these government-sponsored tours. No local media has even been allowed to approach. At the same time, no foreign press are being allowed into Gaza, and so audiences in the West are being fed constant images of their favorite reporters cowering on the ground to take cover from rockets being fired from Gaza. It's why we're seeing countless reports like this one, where journalists are regurgitating lines and talking points fed to them by the Israeli army about decapitated Israeli babies, claims that are going unchecked and unverified. By taking only foreign press into these sites and feeding them info, Israel is again taking control of the narrative on the international stage. Western journalists are more than happy to play along, failing to do basic due diligence in conveying these stories to their audiences. And by not allowing local, Hebrew-speaking media into certain areas, Israel is shielding itself from the criticisms and growing frustrations of a population that could easily eventually turn on the government for failing to protect them. It's a win-win situation for Israel. It gets to put out to the world the images that it wants, dead Israelis, while limiting what it doesn't want the world to see or hear, real-life Gazans as human beings, and preventing its own people from the truth of its colossal failure, right? And it's very difficult to obtain accurate information during times of war because you really don't know what's true and what's false. It takes time to verify these things. It's called the fog of war for a reason. I mean, even a video that you're looking at could be misleading because you could be seeing something that looks legitimate, but it could be old. It could be from an entirely different region of the world. So you've got the fog of war, and on top of that, you have the added issue of this curated one-sided narrative that journalists are accepting from the Israeli government without verifying and fact-checking. And on top of that, you have the additional layer of ignorance from pundits. And if the people in media are ignorant, then the people who are being educated by them are also going to be ignorant. So this is a problem. This is why people are seemingly fine with calls to annihilate Gaza from the face of the world. And Israel wants you to only see Hamas's brutality because they hope that that justifiable anger that you feel when you see it will cultivate support for their barbarity in return. They want you to think that their response is proportionate. It's called manufacturing consent. Now, Cosmic Slop shares how the baby beheading story hasn't been verified, yet it has been reported widely by mainstream media. And also, he points out how the German girl who attended the Israeli music festival during the Hamas attack thought to be dead is actually alive. And in response, Scarlett makes a really good point saying, do any younger folks wonder how the media tricked a bunch of Americans into supporting the Iraq war and more, or does this clear it up? And I think that's a really good point, And it's something that we should all keep in the back of our minds. Odds are, if you're watching this, you're a good person. I think most people are good people. And powerful people are either wittingly or unwittingly exploiting your justifiable sense of outrage over violence to justify genocide and ethnic cleansing. And you can't let fear and emotions persuade you. You have to think clearly and understand that all human life is precious. The lives of Israeli citizens and Palestinians are precious. But the media doesn't want you to think about Palestinian suffering. For example, look at the questions that a BBC reporter asked a Palestinian man who just lost six family members. Look at what she continues to focus on as he explains how dire the situation is and the pain he just experienced. They were just sitting at their home and they were simply bombarded. Their entire building was brought down. Uh, my cousin, uh, Aya, her two children, her husband, her uh, mother-in-law, and two other uh, relatives uh, died immediately, were killed instantly, and two of her youngest children, uh, a twin, two years old, are now in intensive uh, care. This is uh, truly uh, heartbreaking. And the issue here, uh, Kirsty, is that they have no bankers, they have no iron dome, they have nowhere to go. They are simply sitting ducks for the Israeli war machine. I'm sorry for your own personal loss. I mean, can I just be clear, though, you cannot condone the killing of civilians in Israel, can you, nor the kidnapping no, we don't, families? No, we don't condone, and we are very clear, uh, 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 Kirsty. We reject uh, any targeting or harming of civilians from all sides. And you are talking to a Palestinian representative, official, the ambassador that I represent my government, the PLO, the national okay. movement of Palestine. And we have been committed to this for 30 years, not just today or yesterday, 
For 30 years, since the signing of the Oslo Accords, uh, we have committed to non-violence. We have committed to negotiations, so you, as you know. Yes, and so so this so is you, nothing new. That's no. why this question, this question, uh, we have done everything in our power to find a different path. But we have a situation now, as you heard there from Mark, uh, that Hamas may be, it may be an empty threat, uh, threatening to kill hostages. You, do you condemn that My kind of action? Listen, uh, hostages mu must be protected and must be made safe and kept oh, safe. Uh, uh, absolutely, this is has, has no uh, discussion whatsoever. We uh, we 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 must return the moral uh, high ground, uh, and Israel must immediately cease targeting civilians. And by the way, Kirsty, allow me to say this: this is an Israeli military doctrine. They call it the Iron Dome. Whenever there is such a, an incident, they go after the civilians to pressure the fighters. So you've heard one of the Israeli well, we know there's been very, a lot just, of strikes just two today. minutes ago. He wanted to starve the people in Gaza. He wanted to uh, cut electricity but, and water. These are war crimes, collective punishment. So it, there is a possibility that both the UK and the European Commission will cut aid to Palestinians. What's your reaction to that? That would be very, very counterproductive and it doesn't serve anything. Well, they will do exactly what is Israel doing. They will do exactly the collective punishment and, and, and punishing the people who has nothing to do with this. My cousin is not Hamas. In fact, her husband works for the Palestinian Authority, the so, opponents of Hamas. These kids, four years and two years, have nothing to do with Hamas. Everybody, including these silly uh, ideas in the world, are punishing the people uh, that and have we know, and we know to do children, with this. And we know that children Kirsten. that are young are also have died in uh, Israel. So, in your view, is this a contained but appalling conflict between Hamas and Israel? Or do you think Hamas want to widen the conflagration? No, it's Israel now that wa wants to widen the, the, no, but, but, the scope. It's Israel but that Hamas wants to might the want scope. this whole area to be destabilized. Uh, well, well, uh, well, Hamas is a militant group. We are the government. Israel has a government. There is the international community. The first and the foremost important priority now is just to stop this madness. That was so frustrating to watch because like an NPC, she just kept asking the same questions. Yeah, I get that your family's dead, but do you think Hamas is bad or not? When he's explaining, he agrees with her, but she just won't take yes for an answer. And this is a microcosm of a bigger issue that we see with media when it comes to this. They just ignore the suffering of Palestinians. She's literally ignoring the suffering that his family has endured and just continues to ask him about Hamas. Now, in a different interview, he called out this double standard that's all too common with the mainstream media in the West. And I think that what he says here was important. And the mainstream media for, for 75 years, you, get, you bring us here whenever there are Israelis who are killed. Did you bring me here when many Palestinians in the West Bank, more than 200 uh, over the last few months? Do you invite me when there is such Israeli provocations in Jerusalem and elsewhere? Because Israel, what Israelis have seen, which we started by saying tragic, the last 48 hours, the Palestinians see every day for the last 70, uh, 50, 50 years. You know the situation in Gaza, you've just described it. And he is absolutely correct. And the reason why there's this callousness here is because Hamas is being conflated with Palestinians, which therefore places blame on Palestinians for all of the actions of Hamas. And that's a really convenient propaganda trick for a number of reasons. First, it justifies atrocities against Palestinians under the pretense that they struck first, for example. And also, anyone who vocalizes support for Palestinians is labeled a terrorist sympathizer because, again, in their eyes, Hamas and Palestinians are synonymous. Now, take Jake Tapper in the U.S., for example, who also promotes the same exact line of thinking. This does, these last few days have been a real uh, eye-opening period for a lot of people, a lot of Democrats, a lot of progressives, in terms of anti-Semitism on the left. A lot of people who seem more shocked at dehumanizing language uh, used by world leaders to describe Hamas than what Hamas actually perpetrated on Saturday. Yeah. So throughout this video, I've shown you countless examples of dehumanizing language being used. Did you once get the sense that I'm referring to Hamas? I am talking about Palestinian civilians who have nothing to do with Hamas.
Now, you can point to anecdotes that are atrocious. For example, protesters were chanting gas to Jews at a pro-Palestinian rally in Sydney. BLM Chicago tweeted out a photograph saying they support Palestine with one of the Hamas paragliders. On top of that, some DSA protesters in Town Square were celebrating Hamas's actions. Now, Jake Tapper is likely using those examples to suggest that the left is anti-Semitic or supports Hamas. But this kind of reprehensible rhetoric is not a unique phenomenon to the left, right? And any leftist who advocates for Palestinian human rights is always asked if they condemn that type of rhetoric or if they condemn Hamas in the same way that Palestinians are asked if they condemn Hamas as they're explaining the suffering that their family is enduring. But politicians who unequivocally support Israel are never asked to denounce this sort of rhetoric. Fuck Palestine! Palestine to my dick! The response should be from Netanyahu and the military to God. Kill all Palestinians! All of them! Not one left from the river to the sea, Palestine will be deceased! And Israel need to do like this. You see? Now, Gaza. Like this. Gaza need to do like this. Oh, oh, like this, but all this, Jewish. Two options. What do, you, what do you think the response should be to, what do you to Gaza? We gotta mean? wipe them off the fucking Not map. Not I'm Not talking about well, every fucking flat them like a parking lot. Yeah, wait, wait. they're flat in the middle. Once they're there's not, not, there is not nothing else you can do. They they prove to they prove to us that there, there's nothing else you can do. We tried and we tried everything. It doesn't work. We have to wipe them flat off the fucking map, like like a fucking parking lot. Yeah, I'm not stopping till all Arabs are wiped out. I think I think now it's the time that we need to erase Gaza. There is people inside, our people inside, that kidnap, and now we need to kill all of them and free Israel. All, all of their belief is killing Jewish and killing and murder our people. Flatten it. Flatten Gaza. That was video footage from a pro-Israel rally in New York. And, uh, you know, the call to flatten Gaza like a parking lot sounds pretty familiar. I feel like I've heard that before. As we're going to turn that into a parking lot. Mm, that's right. But, you know, there's no calls for this kind of rhetoric to be condemned. None. Imagine if roles were reversed for a moment and an Israeli who just lost their family in a Hamas attack was asked repeatedly, do you condemn that? Do you condemn what these people are saying, completely ignoring the pain and suffering that that person is experiencing and trying to talk about? I think most people can understand that that would be unacceptable because it is. But the reason why they're able to turn their brains off when it comes to Palestinian suffering is because, again, they don't view Palestinians as human beings. They've been dehumanized, hence the dehumanizing language that we're condemning. Now, my point in showing you all of that is not to resort to whataboutism and imply that one side's genocidal rhetoric is okay because the other side is doing it too. The point is to demonstrate that, again, you're only getting one side of the picture. You're not getting the full story. People who advocate for human rights are portrayed as anti-Semitic Cretans who support barbarism against innocent Israeli civilians when that's not the case. All we are saying is that using one atrocity to justify a genocide and ethnic cleansing against a population of people who had nothing to do with what happened on Saturday is wrong. But nobody's willing to say that. And this dehumanization of Palestinians is reinforced through media again and again. It's reinforced by our politicians. And it's also disseminated by people with very large platforms, like ignorant celebrities. For example, Justin Bieber tweeted out a picture that says, Pray for Israel superimposed over a picture of destruction in Gaza. Now, as David Grizzcom puts it, Palestinians don't even get to own pain in U.S. media. It's simply given away to Israel. And he's exactly right. Jamie Lee Curtis did the same thing. She made a post on Instagram in support of Israel, writing terror from the skies with an Israeli flag, not realizing that this was a picture of Palestinian children being bombed by Israel. And while Noah Schlapp from Stranger Things called for peace for Israelis and Palestinians, he also conflated Palestinians with Hamas, writing on Instagram, you either stand with Israel or you stand with terrorism. It shouldn't be a difficult choice. Shame on you. Now, if this were an ordinary 18-year-old or 19-year-old, however old he is saying this, I just think, listen, you really need to work on your wording because you worded that in a very clumsy way. It sounds like you're saying that you think Palestinians are terrorists, and I hope that that's not what you mean. But the problem is that this is no ordinary young man. This is somebody with a very large platform. This is a celebrity, and a lot of people follow him.
But the problem is that what he's saying isn't going to get much pushback because he's just parroting the name, the mainstream narrative, right? He's effectively putting out this idea that is popular and prevalent that if you don't support Israel unconditionally, if you don't support this far right fascist government who's overseeing a brutal regime of apartheid who wants to wipe Gazans off the map, then you must support terrorists. It's a binary choice. Support fascism or you support terrorism. There's no nuance allowed. But again, this idea is just something that we see. It's ubiquitous, right? He's just parroting what he sees. So the media has failed here. Now, believe it or not, media has gotten better over the years, but there's still a lot of work to be done, obviously. But as it stands now, the media is likely going to continue to manufacture consent for war crimes and genocide in Gaza by repeatedly showing you exclusively images of brutality from Hamas and never showing you what's happening in Gaza. Now, to be fair, it's very difficult to get accurate information and images from Gaza when they don't have electricity. But if you want to be informed, the information is out there. And listen, you're right to be outraged by the brutality of Hamas. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing or you're a bad person or you don't care about Palestinians if you are hyper-concerned about the suffering Israelis because you have family there. You're right to be outraged by that, of course. But remember that Israelis aren't the only people suffering right now. Many people are suffering. People. Palestinians in Gaza already had no access to clean water. Most of them did not have access to clean drinking water. They struggled to get the medicine that they needed. And now they just lost power and they're being bombed to death. And people around the world are celebrating their, their deaths and calling for them to be extinct. So, I mean, all I'm saying here is that if you turn a blind eye to that, then you don't have the moral high ground. So it's really important to understand that as calls for genocide get louder, as politicians and media pundits tacitly and uh, overtly endorse the extinction of Palestinians, understand that these are real human beings and they are not responsible for the actions of Hamas and treating them that way is completely unacceptable. Innocent civilians, women and children are dying right now. And I think that if you care about human suffering, you should care about them too because they are human beings, contrary to popular belief.